looks sort of like a purse. I figured it might have been Sean's. I wasn't sure. <laughs> if not, I'm just teasing. If not, I'll make sure it goes back there, okay? Uh, open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter number 6. Jeremiah chapter number 6. And uh, I'll ask you to, to look at a certain uh, verse with me. Jeremiah chapter 6. We're going to start reading in verse 9. I'll ask you to stand with me for a little bit. Jeremiah chapter 6. And, uh, you know, it's uh, two, 2018. 2018. And I saw, I saw the funniest thing. I saw this guy playing uh, Guess Who. You ever play that game? Anybody know what I'm talking about? All right, I saw this, these two guys playing Guess Who, and it's called Guess Who in 2018. And the, 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 the funniest thing about Guess Who is like, okay, is it, you know, is it a man that's bald and has glasses? And the whole point was you can't ask any of these questions because it's 2018, you know? And so, I, I, you know, it caused me to think about sort of where we're at as a society. Uh, Jer- and by the way, can I say this? Um, it was, uh, I, and, and forgive me, this is the history nerd coming out in me, and I just watched a, uh, a movie about the real story of the Von Trapp family that they made The Sound of Music from. It is the fascists in society that say you can't say something. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's not, and by the way, that's even not from the Lord. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. When you find that you're like, oh, you can't say that from the pulpit, you can't say that from the pulpit, something's wrong with that. Uh, Jeremiah chapter number 6, look if you would at verse number 9. And, uh, yeah, it's 2018, and boy, we've, you know, progressed in society, or at least people think so. Uh, but I think there's some old things we need to get back to. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 6, look at verse number 9. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back thine hand as a grape gather into the baskets. Now, you may not know what's going on here. It has to do with God's judgment uh, being proclaimed on uh, on uh, Israel and Judah in particular, look at verse 10. To whom shall I speak and give warning, that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. You see, how does society see the Bible like that? How does some modern Christian see the Bible, honestly, like that? Uh, guys, I'll, I'll tell you this right now. I don't really care to fit in with what everybody thinks is trendy. I don't. See why? Because it comes and it goes anyways. I want to make sure we line up with the book because it never changes. God never changes. Look what it says about the people in this time. They have no delight in it, talking about the word of the Lord. Look, look down, if you would, at verse number 16. Verse number 16. Now, if you were to read all the verses between verse 10 and verse number 16, you'd find uh, a lot of problems with the nation of Israel at that time. There's covetousness, there's idolatry, there's adultery. I mean, the list goes on and on. Look at verse 16. After he says, here's everything that's wrong with you guys. Look what he says in verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Verse 17, Also I sent watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. I want you to call your attention to verse number 16, where the Lord lays out for us that even though we're in new days, we need to apply some old ways in 2018. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, We sure do ask for your blessing right now. I ask that you'd fill me with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray you'd make every listener in here a spirit-filled listener. God, uh, I know the world is changing around us, and there's a pressure for us to change with it. And uh, Lord, uh, I pray you'd help us to be resolute. Lord, help us to see that it's not really just enough to put an arm's distance between us and the world. Lord, there there needs to be a desire in our part, Lord, to, to do what you said, and to go back and to look at what actually works. And to apply it. Lord, I pray for everyone that uh, is either going to watch this online, everyone that's listening here this morning, that they would understand uh, this is not a rant about being old-fashioned for the sake of being old-fashioned. Lord, this is what your word says. It's what you called your people to do when things were a mess during their day. And Lord, we look at our society, it's a mess. Lord, uh, and and we, we know that. We understand we're in the end times. But Lord, help us to do our part as your people. Lord, help us to seek the old paths. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be seated if you would. I found this blog from a pastor, this guy named Michael Wilson, and he says this. 
Oftentimes on Facebook, I see someone say something to the effect of, Our church preaches the old time gospel. And we sing the old time songs. He says, When I hear things like that, I cringe. It's a pastor. Because, you know, I mean, after all, old time gospel, that's bad. <laughs> Telling people that, that, listen, sin is a problem and sin leads to despair and there's the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's old time gospel, guys. That's 2,000 years old, but it still works. Are you saved here this morning? Amen. You know how you got saved? You got saved by listening to an old message that still works. Right. No one had to change the message for you to get saved. And hear this guy saying, listen, when I hear that kind of stuff, you know, it just, it makes me want to cringe. He goes on to say this. They want a preacher that will preach hell is hot. Yes. Yes. Because the world's trying to air condition hell. That's why. They're trying to make you think there's no big deal. Just keep doing what you're doing. There's no heaven. You know, imagine all the people, dun, dun, you know, and uh, there's no heaven. There's no hell. There's no religion. There's no God. Imagine a world like that. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. Just imagine, yeah, listen, I'm telling you right now, guys, there is a hell. There is a heaven. And for a preacher to stand, to get online, and you know what's amazing about this rant? I'll keep reading to you. This, uh, this really blessed me, as you can tell. This really blessed me. He said this, uh, the problem I have with this stream of Christianity is that it's always focused on the negative. Well, let's run through something for a moment. Christ died. Is that negative or positive? Negative. Death is negative. Christ died for our sins. Negative or positive? And was buried. Negative or positive? Negative. And rose again. There's the positive. Now that's good. But you don't get to the good without getting to the negative first. When I go out into the world and I say, Jesus Christ loved you enough to die for you. Ah, who's Jesus Christ? Why does that matter? It doesn't matter until they understand their condition. The Bible calls the, 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 the message that we preach the gospel. The word gospel means Good news. Well, what's good news about God loves you? Well, there's no good news. Well, sure he does. I'm a great guy. Of course God loves me. Do you understand how the world looks at that when you say God loves you? Well, yeah, sure. I go to church. I'm a good person. That's not what it's about. God loved you enough to die for your dirty, stinking, rotten sins. A holy and a righteous God did that. That's the good news. But you don't really understand the good news till you get through the bad news first. He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. Amen. Right? You know what the bad news was? I was single and so alone. I was petrified. I'm not going to sing. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> this guy goes on. He says this. The good news of the kingdom. You ready for this? Is that God is not mad at people, that he's not holding their sins against them, and that he wants a love relationship with them. What does that even mean? A love relationship. I, I, explain that. You know what the gospel is? The gospel is Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And you can escape hell and the judgment of God. And you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ and with God if you're willing to accept the payment that Jesus Christ made on the cross of Calvary. That is the gospel. Why would a preacher have a problem with that? I'll tell you why he has a problem with that. Because he ain't preaching it. And when you go out and you preach it, it bothers him. This guy goes on to say, uh, how many sermons in the book of Acts do you read where the apostles threatened people with hell if they didn't receive Jesus into their hearts? Well, I'll tell you this, the word hell is mentioned twice in Acts chapter 2. The first great message is ever preached at Pentecost. Peter mentions hell. You know what that guy's figuring? No one reads their Bible. So he can say what he wants to on Facebook and no one's going to check him out. I'll check him out and you ought to check him out. But you know what's interesting about that? He goes on, he goes on to say this. Grandma and grandpa's generation were familiar with church, and at that time, ministers were respected. Lives revolved around church. It's not that way anymore. So, you know what, then? Let's just give up. Let's just go home. Right. Since this is not like it used to be. This guy goes on to say, what's going to turn things around is when we start listening to the stories of people and just love them where they are. Well, I, I believe in that, but why does it have to be one or the other? Right. You know what he's presenting? He's presenting a false choice to you. Either love people and show compassion on them or preach this evil, this mean, nasty, a hell message. Listen, if you love them and you listen to them and you have compassion on them, tell them you can escape this. You don't have to pick one or the other. All these modern guys do the same thing. They want to make you think that if you preach the truth, you don't love people. 
Guys, Jesus Christ said, where the, worm, uh, where, the, where the fire is not quenched, where the worm dieth not, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, Mark chapter 9, that was your Savior that did that. He said, why did he do that? He didn't want people to go there. You know what's amazing about this guy's rant? Not one time does he, one time does he quote Scripture. A pastor. Now, why am I pointing that out? Guys, we need to get back to the truth. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Now, I understand. I, listen, I get it. You, some of you might think, well, you know, if you only know me from seeing me behind the pulpit, you might think, this guy lives with his head in the sand, doesn't know what's going on. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm out in the business world. I see what's going on. I hear the stuff at work. I, I get what's going on in the world. I have a TV. I get all that stuff. But it doesn't mean we change our message. If there ever was a time that the world needs our message, guys, it's now. <laughs> It's not time to retreat. It's not time to withdraw. It's not time to go, well, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. And you know what? It's too hard to preach the truth anymore. So you might as well just blend in with the rest of it. No, that's wrong. You know, I, read, I was watching the news. I was uh, watching news with my wife the other night. And, um, and uh, they were talking about, uh, I think it was St. Thomas Aquinas. It was a, it was a Catholic school. They're, uh, they're, they have LGBT, if I get the acronyms right, I always mess it up, LB, LG, whatever it is, dorms now in a Catholic school. You know why? Because certain religions don't mind blending in as long as they keep the power. We're not here to keep the power. We're here to stand for Jesus Christ. We're not here for the people's money. We're here to tell them the gospel. We're here to give them truth. I look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, some of you may think, well, things are getting better. By the way, I can't, I can't believe this. This guy actually wrote in here somewhere. I can't remember where, where it is. Um, but he says this, times change and we must change with them. Well, here's an example of times changing. We got lights on in here. We're not lighting candles. Is that good enough? I mean, we drove cars. We didn't drive in a horse, you know, drawn carriages. We're not Amish. But times changing doesn't mean that God changes. You're dealing with an eternal being that's not bound by time. And you've got a book that matches this character. Why would you change any of it? Now, some Christians today, because they don't know any better, some of them have been deceived. Some of them have never been in the Bible. They've never been shown. They never have been taught. They actually believe, and this guy wrote this in his little blog, whatever that is. He wrote that, you know, really the world is getting better. I'm thinking to myself, does this guy even have a Bible? Because if you look at what the Bible says about the end times, it doesn't get better. <laughs> Guys, if it got better... Over time, now let me, let, me get, let me give you that. Some of you are thinking, yeah, we got modern medicine. I'll grant you that. Thank God. Wonderful. But let me give you this statistic. In New York City in 19, uh, 1917, so 100 years ago, uh, children born out of wedlock were 2%. Today it's over 50%. Is it getting better? Violent crimes at 400% from 100 years ago. Is it getting better? Now, come on, guys. You, you can't be serious and say things are getting better in the world. You can't attack the bedrock and the foundation of what formed our society, biblical truth, without reaping the consequences of it. And we're seeing that right now. And you know what you've got? You've got a bunch of cowards. You've got a bunch of hirelings behind the pulpit who are more concerned with their offerings than they are preaching the truth. And they know that if they get in front of the TV or they get in front of the pulpit or their message goes online and it's not positive and upbeat every single Sunday, God wants you to be a winner. Right. Well, sometimes, yeah, and sometimes you lose. It's part of life. You don't always win everything. You know, uh, this positive, overly positive stuff. Guys, you, I'm going to challenge you. Read what the Apostle Paul says about the world and the world system. And you tell me if he goes, it's just wonderful. I can't wait to make it a better world. Paul doesn't waste one minute of his time talking about making the world a better place to live. Amen. He talks about what's up there. And he talks about reaching as many people as you can to take them with you. And if you really cared about making the world a better place, you wouldn't be so focused on social justice. That's the new message being preached by churches. You'd be preaching the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus did not come to be communist, okay? He didn't come so that women could have equal pay with men. I'm sorry, that's the truth. He came to save your soul. Now, I'm not saying anything about women's power. I don't care about that. That's not my point. My point is, he didn't come to make society fair. Matter of fact, my Savior said, you have the poor with you always. You know what he came for? He came to save your soul and to give you a purpose beyond this life. I'm glad he did. But do you know what the Bible says about the end times? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and look at verse 1. 
Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now let me just stop you real quick. Guys, we need to understand right there in that verse that if somebody's departing from something, that means they were once a part of it, right? It doesn't mean that they lost their salvation. That's not what this verse teaches. It just teaches that what used to be held on to, what used to be common uh, biblical truth, what used to be a common biblical standard. Listen, I know some of this might be offensive. I don't say stuff to be offensive, I promise you. But years ago, it was not cool for a young Christian couple to just shack up. If you want to do that, get married. Amen. Hey, listen, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was just common for, for a, a Christian to say, yeah, I go to the clubs and I drink, but I just do it in moderation. That wasn't common. What has changed? I'll tell you what's changed. The Bibles have been rewritten, and the preachers don't want to preach the truth. And you know what's happening to those out in the congregation? I'll tell you this. I learned this a long time ago. The pew never rises higher than the pulpit. And if what's coming out of the pulpit doesn't help you and doesn't challenge you in your, in your life, you're not going to move on for Jesus Christ. And that's what's going on out there. You say, what's happening? People are departing from the faith. You've got preachers telling people, don't go to church. Send me your money, but don't go to church. That's interesting. You know, some shall depart from the faith. Look at this, giving, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, it goes on to say, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with the hot iron. Now, you say, what is that? That's not, that's not very positive. I understand that. Here's the positive side, though, if you're saved. The positive is, when you see these things happening, know that His coming is really close. Amen. There's a positive in it if you're saved. But I also want you to understand, guys, that there is a, as time goes on, Every, as we get closer and closer to the end of the church age, before the coming of Jesus Christ, before he comes to rapture us out of here, the church is going to move further and further and further away from the cross of Jesus Christ. You're going to go to some churches, you can walk into some churches where you will not hear the gospel at all. You'll go to some churches in 2018 where all you're going to hear is about how to make a, a successful career, how to have a nice family, how to do this. You're not going to hear the gospel. You're going to hear, listen, we need to uh, make sure we're good stewards of the environment. Environmentalism and social justice has replaced the gospel of Jesus Christ in a lot of churches today. Yeah. True story. True. And, the, and what church actually is, is being reshaped before our very eyes. A lot of Christians don't even realize it. You say, why is that? Well, because they figure, well, if everything's getting better and they don't know any better, they don't know that, listen, the Bible forewarns us that as the time goes on, that in the latter days, some are going to depart from the faith. It's our job to hold on, guys, and to seek the whole past. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6, and let me say this about it. Jeremiah chapter number 6, back in our main passage, Jeremiah chapter 6, and point out to you there in verse number 16, he says, Stand ye in the ways, verse 16, and see and ask for the old paths. You say, who said that? Look at verse 16. Thus saith the Lord. You know, you know what that shows you? That's God talking. When it says, when someone stands up and says, thus saith the Lord, they better be right. It better be God saying it or they're committing a really big error. This guy, being inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, writes what the Lord says. And the Lord says, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and ask for the old paths. You know what that means? Old paths are proven. You say, why? Because God installed them. God implemented them. You know, back there in 1 Samuel chapter 17, you may or may not remember it. In 1 Samuel chapter number 17, uh, David is just a young man. And David shows up at the battle between Goliath and the, the giant of the Philistines and the nation of Israel. And there's this valley in between them. And they're standing off, you know. And uh, it's not a dance off and it's not a sing off, you know. It's a real battle. They're standing off. And, and the Philistines are over here, and they're cursing God. They're cursing the God of Israel. They're mocking his name. And the Israelites are just standing there shaking. They've got God on their side, and no one's doing anything. And David shows up, and David shows up like a, like a young man, real rambunctious. You know, he's like a, a first-year Bible college student. He wants to charge hell with a squirt gun. He's ready to go, you know. And, and he, he shows up with all this energy and all this passion going, Hey, guys, what's going on? And the king of Israel goes, David, you just don't understand. Look at he's Goliath. David goes, but what is this uncircumcised Philistine in the sight of God? That he should defy the armies of the living God. So Saul says, if you're determined to go on this suicide mission, son, go for it. You know what Saul does? He goes, let me give you some armor. 
He grabs his armor. They start putting the breastplate on David, and David's going, David's just a little, he's a young man, a little shepherd boy. And he's going, this doesn't feel right. And they put the, you know, helmet, it's probably two sizes too big, you know, and it's sort of clunking around. And, and, and David's trying this stuff on, and he goes, uh, th- this doesn't seem quite right. You know what David says? David says this. He girded his sword upon his armor, and he has said to go. You know why? He, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, the sword, all this bulky armor. Why? For I have not proved them. David stuck with a little sling, sling side. You say, why? He'd proven it before. God used it before. Instead of us redesigning how the family should look. Instead of us saying, well, you know, I think it doesn't matter the role of a husband and wife. You're, you're a fool if you say that. That's right. They're different. People say, oh, they're not different. They're exactly the same. I can't believe you had to have this conversation. And, you know, but it's true. You stick, look, guys, let's just do this. Let's take a bunch of boys and girls in a room full of army toys and tanks and Barbie dolls and see what naturally happens. The boys will line up the Barbie dolls to be blown up. Amen? <laughs> And the girls would go, no, no, it's my doll, right? Why is that? No, listen, without any kind of external social engineering, no one tells them anything. They naturally go to what they are familiar with, with what is kin to their gender, all right? The roles are different. Men and women are different. This is not bad. Guys are looking like, you, you're walking, pay, preacher, you're saying some stuff that's real, real dangerous. No, it's different for a reason, guys. You should look at this. And it's so funny. They talk about celebrating diversity. If we're all the same, how can we do that? Amen. If men and women are any different, why should I go, man, she really compliments me. Right? You know, what's going on? Everything's being re-engineered out there. And if you're not careful as a child of God, you'll go, yeah. And you'll hear it on the news. And they talk about it at work. And you read it online. And you see this post. And you read this. And they tell you in school this. And your whole life you hear this. And you go to college and you hear this. And so by the time you come to a Bible in church and the preacher preaches, you go, what is this strange new doctrine? <laughs> it's just Bible. <laughs> it's Bible. A uh, young lady was here the other day, in, uh, Wednesday night. And uh, she was, uh, uh, we jokingly call her Ariana number one. And so she was behind the pulpit, you know. And uh, she goes, how do I do this? And I said, what are you doing? She goes, preach. I said, well, I said, I appreciate the desire, you know. And, uh, and I said, but, you know, just so you know, you don't have to worry about that. She goes, what do you mean? I said, now, let me tell you how to preach the gospel, how to tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. Let me show you how to do that. I showed her that. I said, but you never have to worry about preaching behind a pulpit. She goes, really? I said, yeah. I said, I said, listen, biblically, the Bible says that's, that's for the men. Now, right there already, automatically, someone goes, oh, that's insensitive. I don't know why you're saying that. Why are you saying that? Listen, if that bothers you, you've got to go back and go, why would I have a problem with something that God says? Amen. I'm not a chauvinist. I treat my wife very well. I love her to death. Not sure. I don't believe you should walk all over your wife. You know what's amazing to me? These guys out there that talk about men and women being equal, they never hold the door for a lady. They'll make a lady pay for it. You tell me who's treating a lady better. Don't kid me with all this equality garbage, you know. Here's the, here's the point. The point is this. We need to go back to some things that are proven. You know what's proven? What God says. You know what's not proven? What the media says. Uh, the only way I can say it's been proven is every other society that's ever been destroyed from the inside out followed what they said. Yes. That's it. You know, over there in the book of Acts, you've got uh, the Athenians. And, you know, the only reason they ever get together is to hear or to tell some new thing. You know, I know sometimes you come to church, you go, I just want to hear something new. And that's good. You need to hear new things. I get it. But, you know, there's some things you need to hear that are old. You know, really, husbands love your wives. Wives submit to your husbands. Uh, children obey your parents. Fathers provoke not your children to wrath. Servants, you know, obey them that have the rule over you. I mean, the list goes on and on. There are things in the Bible that you go, well, I've already heard that before. Okay, but are you actually seeking it? The world out there is always going, here's the next new thing. Here's the next new thing. Here's the next new thing. And sometimes, if you're not careful, you just get wrapped up in this constant cycle of what's new, what's new, what's new. Got to have what's new. Got to buy what's new. Got to know what's new. New, new, new. And sometimes you go, you know what? I need to step back from that and just say, Lord, what actually works? What's going to help me in my life? You know, this is not new. This is old-fashioned. But getting up with the sun, that's good for you. I know there's some people that work a third shift. Listen, I'm not, 
pastor's preaching that I need to get up at, you know, four in the morning, and I just got off a double, and I can't, I didn't say that, you guys understand, but there's some things that are old-fashioned that are good for you, and sometimes we discount them just because they're old. New ideas on marriage. We don't need new ideas on marriage. God gave us the best one. New ideas on how to raise kids. One, two, listen, if that kid had a gun, he'd shoot you by now. Out of control. What did I say? Three, three and a half, three and three quarters. Mommy's getting really upset. They're not listening. You say why? Because this new idea on how to raise kids ain't working. What I'm getting at is this. You go back to the Bible and you'll find out it's a lot more. It's not always easy, but it's simple. But it's old fashioned. And you've got to look for it. And you've got to seek it in your life. This guy, Carl Lentz, was on the Oprah show and he says this, our thing is to say, he was trying to talk about this new version of the gospel. He said, God loves everybody. Our thing is, th- is to say, hey, if you allow God, now you tell me if you can get the gospel out of this, okay? This is a transcript. I'm not putting words in this man's mouth. If you allow God, if you bow your knee, admit your need of God, well, for what? Why do I need God? I got a car. I got a house. I got a job. What do I need God for? And if you do that, and, and, and the Lord, there's a moment where my repentance matters, and it's right now. I'm handing over the keys, and if you do that, I think the premise of Christianity is looking in the mirror going, all right, I'm not going to make it. I can't do enough. God, I need you. Make it to where? To what? Do You see what? They're, they're, dodge, they're dodging and ducking. You see why? So there's no mention of heaven. There's no mention of hell. There's no mention of redemption. There's no mention of justification. There's no mention of sin. I believe there's a rescue of salvation that you can't counterfeit any other way. Well, for salvation from what? Guys, this is what's being preached out there. Uh, I, I, Oprah said, today I feel the fierce love of all that is God. Well, what's all that is God? You know, people are out there just eating this stuff up. Yeah. Rob Bell, this guy, this leader in the emerging church, you guys might go, I don't like people that name names. You know what Paul names names? I'm doing this for a reason, I promise. Rob Bell says, to affirm the bodily resurrection of Jesus is to affirm the goodness of all bodies. <laughs> right? And that includes yours. Oh, man. Doug Padgett says this, the inerrancy debate, talking about is the Bible inerrant, is the book you have in your hands without error. Mine is. I believe that. All right? The inerrancy debate, listen to this, is based on the belief that the Bible is the Word of God. Uh-huh. That the Bible is true because God made it and gave it to us as a guide to truth, yeah? But that's not what the Bible says. You know what's amazing? He never quotes scripture. He just says, that's not what the Bible says. And you know, you got a bunch of people out there going, yeah. It doesn't matter what, what, what Bible, it doesn't matter if the Bible, it's not really about what God says, it's just about what God means for our life. The father of communism said this, the single family ceases to be the economic unit of society. Private housekeeping is transformed into a social industry. The care and education of the children becomes a public affair. Society looks at after all children alike, whether they're legitimate or not. You say, what is that? You know what that is? That's saying we don't need the old family structure. Just We're going to re-engineer this thing. Nishi, the great philosopher, everybody goes, oh, he's so smart. He's an idiot. <laughs> idiot. You say, what? Because he says everything that he said was against God. That's why I know he's, he's wrong. You go, who are you to say that Nietzsche was wrong? He's a smart, he's a great philosopher. You're not a philosopher. No, I'm not, but I can read. And what he said was against what God says, so he's wrong. You know what he says? He says, there are no eternal facts and no absolute truths. Is that a little ironic <laughs> to emphatically state that there are no absolutes? Does anybody else see the irony in that? I can absolutely stand here and tell you that there are no eternal facts and there are no absolute truths. What a joke. Can you not see through that, guys? You say, what is that? Something new. Something new. Something besides the Bible. You know, back there in the Old Testament, you've got the story of David, the greatest king that the nation of Israel ever had. And after him, there was Solomon. And after Solomon, there was his son, Rehoboam. And when Solomon died, Rehoboam had a chance to listen to what the old men told him. Yes, yes. And the old counsel that they gave him was, listen, your dad was a great king, and we experienced a lot of peace, but he taxed the, you know, what out of these people. You need to lighten up a little bit. All right? The temple's been built. Let's just back off of, the, off of that tax stuff, and let's just deal kindly with the people. You're a young king. You don't know what you're doing yet. Give it some time. 
I don't know if I like that. He goes to the young guys. He goes, hey, guys, what do you think? You tell them if they think that your daddy was strong, your daddy just ruled them with a pinky, you're going to rule them with a fist. Right, right. The kingdom splits. Right. Why? He didn't hearken to the counsel of the old men. You say, what did he do? Well, he was looking through his Facebook feed and his Instagram feed and his Twitter feed, and he said, well, you know, these guys say this and these guys say this, and I think I like this more. This is new after all. Yeah, and it ruined his kingdom. What am I saying? Sometimes going back to what is old is best because it's proven. Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. Look at verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Old paths are proven. You see why? God is behind them. God is behind them. Old paths, secondly, let me say this, require a stand to be made. You know, I can't, I have to tell you, it, it bothers me at how anemic Christianity has become. Where you get a preacher that gets on TV and they ask him point blank, do you believe in hell? Do you believe in heaven? Do you believe in God's judgment? Well, you know, that's not for me to decide. And Well, well come on, what is it? You know what no one wants to do? No one wants to stand. Nobody wants to be the oddball that looks different or talks different or acts different or lives different. Hey, guys, you'll never make a difference unless you're different. You understand that? Old paths require a stand to be made. Look at verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways. You say, why? You can't see clearly unless you learn to stand. If you're always sitting, guess what you see? You see what everybody else sees. You know what they say in the military? The high ground wins. You say, why? You've got a better vantage point there. If as a child of God, God says stand, you know what you got to do? Stand. You ever have your kid, you know, call your kid from another room? Emma! Emma! What? Come here. Why? I said so. Right? You know, you're not going to, well, because, you know, it's this time of day, and we're going to be doing this, and, hey, I'm calling you. We'll talk about when you get here. Get over here. You know what God says? Stand. Stand. You know, for some Christians, it's, it's time to quit sitting. It's time to get up. You know, as a child of God, when you first get saved, you're a babe in Christ. Everything's new. It's all new. And just like a baby, boy, they spit up on themselves, amen? They make a mess of things. You know, back in the nursery, sometimes you go back there, and it's like, woo, someone lit this place up, you know? <laughs> And, uh, and, and they make a mess of things sometimes. Thank God you got people that will clean them up, right? You know, baby Christians are that way. Sometimes they do that. But eventually that baby Christian, they, they stay in the Word. They stay in church. And they stay in fellowship with God's people. One day you see them go like this. You're going, yeah, that's it, that's it. And they're going, you know what? Quit, I quit doing this. I quit going there. It wasn't good for me. And, and they're a little, a little wobbly, a little shaky, you know. And we're, we're supposed to be there to encourage them, not discourage them, by the way. I swear, some Christians have the ministry of discouragement. They know exactly when to say the wrong thing at the perfect time. <laughs> Don't engage in that ministry. And, and boy, before you know it, they're doing little, little baby steps like this, you know. And every once in a while, they still fall, and we try to help them pick them back up and say, you can keep going, you know. And someday, one day, just like it is with your children, one day you see them running track or running in, in a game of football or playing volleyball. You go, I can't believe that that was the same individual that I had to hold, that I had to help uh, uh, keep their balance when they were trying to learn how to walk. I can't believe that's the same person that was spitting up all over themselves. And now they're talking back as a teenager. Amen. <laughs> you know, I can't believe. And then they grow, right? Listen, what, I, what I'm getting at is this. Eventually, as a child of God, it is time to stand. On your own two feet with God's help. Stand, he says. In Ephesians chapter number 6, you know what the Lord says? Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Go with me over there. Ephesians chapter number 6. You know, it's time for Christians to stand up. And, uh, you know, back in the 90s, it was, you know, come out of the closet. I don't know that there's any need for anyone to come out of the closet. The closet's been inverted. Christians are the ones in the closet now. Some of you Christians need to come out of the closet with the truth. And quit hiding who you are and what you believe and what you stand for. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, look if you would at verse number 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This world is not your home. Like the old song says, I'm just a passing through, right? Look at verse number 13. 
Wherefore, the world is your enemy, the devil is your enemy. They want to destroy everything that is right in your life for Jesus Christ. It is your job as a child of God to stand against it and to let everybody know, here I stand, I can do no other. You say, who said that? Martin Luther. Back at the Diet of Worms, the, bio, uh, the, the history teaches us that you know, everybody venerates this guy as this great speaker and you know, he stood against the powers that be in his day. His story from his own lips was, I was trembling as I was walking to meet this council of people. I was ill, he says, I was ill within my body. Talking about feeling like he's going to throw up. And when he gets there and they start asking him these questions and barraging him with these questions, he knew, he said, I'm eventually, I'm, I'm a dead man. But you know, he got up and said, here I stand. I like that. I like that. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Listen, sometimes it's harder than others. I admit, around certain crowds, boy, being the oddball and standing up and standing out, it's hard. But notice the very next verse. He says it again. Stand there for it. Over and over. What's the Lord trying to get through to us? He wants us to stand. He says over there in Jeremiah chapter 6, stand in the ways. He wants you to look and assess the situation around you and understand where the world is at today and in light of who you are as a child of God, where do you fit in that? I'm not talking about being a hermit and withdrawing from the world and you have no interaction with the outside world. I'm saying that you stand in the world and you say, you know what, I'm not going to blend in. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to stand out. Why? Because I want to be walking with Jesus Christ. I want to be seeking the old paths. I don't want to be sitting while everybody else is sitting. If they're sitting, I'm going to stand. If they're standing, I'm going to say, so you're going to be all that defiant. Against the world and against the devil, Yes. You need to learn to do that in your life. Listen, I'm not talking about rebellion against government or rebellion against the, the, you know, uh, uh, God-ordained powers, but against the system of this world, you ought to be defiant. You should be. You say, why? God requires us to stand for us to see right. You say, I said it before, high ground wins. Remember over there in the Gospels, there's this little... I, 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 every time I read Luke chapter 19 and I read about Zacchaeus, I'm always like, yeah, I get that guy. Because I'm, a, you know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, you know. Uh, I, I, I've always been the grunt in any sport that I've played. I've always been the runt, you know, the, one, the, little, the smallest guy. And, and here's the story in Luke chapter 19 about Zacchaeus, and, and he sees the throngs of people surrounding Jesus Christ. And Zacchaeus, you know what he could have done? Because he wanted, there was a desire in his life to change. He just wanted to be different. He was tired of the old life. He was tired of being a crook. He was tired of the testimony he had. He said, I just want to start over, but he didn't know how. And Zacchaeus sees the crowds of people running around Jesus Christ. He says, I'll never get there. I'll never get his attention. I'm, you know, uh, five foot six or whatever the case, five foot three. I can't get there. I'm too small. You know what he does? He gets to high ground. And he climbs that sycamore tree. And when he gets to that sycamore tree, he doesn't even yell at Jesus Christ. Jesus notices him. He says, hey, Zacchaeus, come down. Let's have fellowship. How did he get God's attention? He got to higher ground. You want to get God's attention in your life? Get to higher ground than from where the rest of the world is at. If they say, oh, this is okay, it's no big deal, and God says something different, just get a little bit higher than that. It'll help you in your life. You see, what is higher ground for? It's for victory. Over there in World War II, it was uh, back in the, uh, in the Battle of the Bulge, there were 12,000 under-equipped and exhausted U.S. paratroopers of the 101st Airborne. And they were pinned behind enemy lines. There were 15 divisions of Germans, of German units, 15 divisions from the German army surrounding them. And the 101st had been told, listen, Patton's Third Army is coming. Patton's Third Army is coming. And you know what they did? They were sustained for days with airdrops from C-47s. And they were outnumbered and outgunned, and eventually the, the commander, the commandant of the, the leading uh, division of the German army, uh, Friar von Ludwitz, asked the 101st acting commander, Captain Anthony McAuliffe, to surrender. Do you know what his answer was? Nuts! You say, what is that? That's a man that knew how to stand. And they held off long enough until the 3rd Army got there, and they won. We call that the Battle of the Bulls. You say, what does it take? It takes some guts to do that. 
It's not always going to be easy. Old paths require a stand. Let me say this. Old paths are not accidental. They're not. You say, I want my life to change. I want it to be more in the image of Jesus Christ. I want to be closer to him this year. I want my family to line up with what God's word says. I want my marriage to be better for Jesus Christ. I want my thinking to be right. I want to do something for God this year. I want it to be different. Let me say this. You don't just fall into that. You don't wake up one day, you know, these, 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 these athletes don't wake up one day with, you know, a six-pack. It doesn't happen, all right? There's a lot of work, you know. Some are going, well, I've got a dozen right here, amen. <laughs> you know, i got something going on right there. I don't know if it's a six. Someone asked me the other day, hey, Adrian, you got, I know you've been working out. you got a six-pack. I said, i got a pack, but it ain't a six-pack, amen. It don't look that good. But here's the point. You don't wake up one day and just go, wow, that looks great. There's some work that goes into that. Finding the old paths isn't accidental. You know what the Lord says? Ask. For the old paths. You know what that means? You need to learn to ask God. You need to get in your Bible. Lord, what do you say from your book? I'm amazed at the number of times Christians will go an entire week without cracking that book open. You need to get in your Bible, Christian. It'll change your life. Ask your God. Ask your church family. Ask your pastor. Forget the world's advice. You know what some people do? They get lost, you know, and they don't want to stop and ask for directions. Guys, can you empathize with that? You, you, ladies, you may have, this is your lucky morning, you all right? You ready for this? I found a study that male drivers are lost longer than women. <laughs> the average male drives an extra 276 miles every year as a result of being lost. Compared to 256 miles for women. You say, how's that? More than one out of four men, 26%, wait at least half an hour before asking for directions. One of the first arguments we had, it was on our honeymoon, I think it was, and we were lost. There's no GPS. This is 2000. There was GPS, but we were too poor to have it, and it wasn't mainstream. It wasn't on your phone for sure. And, uh, and she goes, well, why don't you stop and ask for directions? I'm like, no, I got it. <laughs> you know, an hour later, I think, I think I need to pull over. Oh, really? You know? <laughs> you know, some people are that way. Some Christians are that way. Some, listen, I'm, I'm, say, I'm going to say this graciously. Some of you won't ask anyone for anything, and you need to learn how to do that. You need to learn how to say, I don't know if this is the right. Some Christians, I know some Christians have never asked counsel from any other Christian in their entire Christian life. Hey, can I say this? You're shortchanging yourself. You're shortchanging yourself. There, there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't have all the answers. He says, ask for the old past. You need to lose. Lord, here's where my life is going. Does it line up with what your book says? Lord, this is what I think about this thing. <coughs> This is the path I'm going in. Does it line up with your path? Back in the 50s, there was an Air Force transport flying over Alaska. And they got into a bad snowstorm. I mean, you think this is bad out there. It ain't nothing compared to the stuff that you see in Alaska. And they get, back, they, they get lost in this snowstorm. And the, uh, the uh, folks from the tower are dealing with the, the guy, the, the pilot. And they're saying, hey, here's your coordinates. Here's the direction you need to go in. And he goes, no, I think my coordinates are right. No, they're not right. Here's where you're actually at. And he goes, that's not what I'm seeing. Based on what he was seeing at the time where he was, he ignored the counsel that he got from someone who could actually see where he was. And by the time he realizes we're in a mess and they start dropping out of the plane, listen, those guys parachute out of that plane. You know what happens? Negative 70 degrees with the wind chill. Those guys hit the ground within minutes. They're dead. You say, why? I know which way I'm going. I don't need to ask anybody. Okay. All right. But that's how it ends. You say, why? Because there's someone that can see what you can't see. He knows what's best for your family. He knows what's best for this church. He knows what's best for your life. He knows what's best for society, even though they kicked them out. Old paths are not accidental. Let me say this. Old paths provide us with contrast. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 6. Contrast. You see what you mean by that? Well, that's, I, think, I think that's why a lot of people, and Christians included, don't seek the old paths. Because by virtue of saying, for example, I am the way, the truth, and the life. By virtue of Jesus Christ being the way, that means there is no other way. You say, why? By contrast. And so when you read Jeremiah chapter 6, and God is speaking, by the way, thus saith the Lord, verse 16, stand ye in the ways and see and ask 
for the old paths, where is the good way? If that is the good way, guess what the new path is? It is the not so good way, maybe you might say. It is the bad way. It is the evil way. All right? It is an unproven way, but it's, it's a contrast there. Think about what Jesus Christ says. Uh, you know what he says? He says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. You're just narrow-minded. Yeah, sure. Okay. You see why? Because there's only one way in. And there's only one truth. And there's only one God. You say, well, that's so narrow. You know what's so funny about that? What's amazing about that is those are the people that want to silence you. You know what I think? Hey, I'm an American, honestly. You don't want to believe in God? You want to talk about what you believe in? Go for it, man. You're not going to offend me a bit. You say, well, I'm confident in what I believe. When I find, you know, some, some person on a college campus losing their mind and screaming because someone is quoting Scripture, I find someone who's not confident in what they believe. Old past provide us with a contrast. You say, what does the word straight mean? According, according to Webster's 28, narrow, close, not broad. <laughs> there is no good. There is no bad. They're just, things just are. No, that's not true. In the Bible, you have death versus life, holiness versus sin, good versus evil, pride versus humility. You know what Proverbs 14, 12 says? There is a way which seemeth right unto man, a way. But the end thereof are the ways of death. You know what that is? That's man's way versus God's way. You say, what is that? That's contrast. Do you know why people don't want to seek the old path? Because by virtue of acknowledging that there is an old path and that it's good and that it's right, you say, what? Let me give you one example. This old book right here, I hear people talk about it all the time. It's too hard to understand. People love Shakespeare and they hate the King James Bible. It blows my mind. You know, what don't you understand about thou shalt not commit adultery? That's pretty plain to me. You know, that means you dance. You, you remember the one that brought you to the dance is what that means. Amen. All right. Uh, listen, there's all kinds of people say that that's just old fashioned. Preaching is old fashioned. You know, where's the let me just say this. I'm going to get this off my chest and be done with it. All right. I've been holding in for a while. If you have to go to a church and they have to give you a waiver to sign off before you enter the service because of the smoke machines and the light show. You're not in a church. All right? You're, you may be in a place of entertainment, but here's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to be mean. You might think I'm, I'm throwing stones. I'm trying to get you to understand that's where the world is influenced, the church. Where we got to have, you know, you got to have the, the laser show and you got to make everybody, you say, what are we doing? Oh, we're just getting you jacked up, you know? And, and boy, it, it would really stink if we tried it. Amen? That's about all we get right there. Uh, I got the lights, man. I got the lights, Pastor. Here we go. Wee! You know? But listen, you know what that is? That's manipulating your emotions to get you like this. You know what else can do that? No, 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 no. Because you don't know what we're saying. We're nirvana. Da, da, da. No, you say, what? Was it? it just jacks you up? There's nothing to it, though. Is that going to bring you to God? No. Why do you think you have to have your emotions manipulated before church? Let me tell you something. If you don't get excited when you hear about Jesus Christ, then, then that's on you. That's not on the preacher. And it's not on the church either. You want to have a real relationship with him. When someone talks to me, you go, oh, man. When someone talks about heaven, it should put a smile on your face. When they talk about the grace of God in your life, it should do something for you. You don't need the artificial stuff. You say, what is that for? Well, so we can feel like we do at a theater. Is that really what you want at church? Listen, I'm not, I know you may think I'm just, you're just old-fashioned. You're, listen, I'm not just being old-fashioned for the sake of being old-fashioned. I'm telling you that in most churches today, what you have is a watered-down gospel where people can sit there their entire lives and not know what it means to be saved. Now you tell me what's dirty and low-down. Me pointing it out or them leading people to destruction. I'm not, and, and, and this message is not about us versus them. I'm trying to paint a picture for you in regards to why we believe in the old paths. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Some of you are like, preacher, I could have stayed home if you are going to do this. <laughs> I risked my life for this message. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Look at verse 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. 
really, I, I understand that the world tries to blur everything and make everything great. There's a lot more black and white than probably we want to acknowledge in life in general. Verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record, to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Do you know what brought revival in our country? Do you know what brought about ladies? Do you know what brought about women's suffrage? Do you know what changed? You say, oh, it was people, the progressive thinkers. No. It was the Bible being preached and the right place being put on the female. You go, to, you go to these countries where the Bible's never been, and ladies, you're just a piece of garbage. I'm not trying to be mean, but that's how they treat ladies. Right. You say, what makes it different here? What makes it different is that there's a foundation of the Bible and the Word of God. What am I getting at? What I'm getting at is this. What everybody seems to be telling you out there is not really truth. What they're telling you is, this new way will make it better. This new way will make it more equitable. This new way. No, no, no. Let's go back to what brought about real, real life. You guys know what brought about the Industrial Revolution? You understand what brought about the Reformation and the Renaissance? Was the Bible being put in people's hands. It was truth that changed the world. The, the scientific advances that we had, even when it comes to hygiene. Guys, listen, you've got doctors, the, mind, the brilliant minds of the day in the 1700s aren't washing their hands and running water. Why? Because that's not what they learned in medical school. Well, Leviticus, 1800 B.C., says you run with wash, or, uh, wash your hands with running water. You say, what happened, happened for them to advance? They had to go back to the Bible to catch up and make it more progressive. Listen, it doesn't matter what area of your life we're talking about. Whether it's your family or your walk with Jesus Christ, the new stuff isn't going to do it. It's the old paths. The old paths are for our walking. Over there in Jeremiah, you know, he says, he says, stand and ask for the old paths that ye may what? Walk therein. There's a story about the early African converts back in the 1800s. You got to understand, as far as the deep, the heart of Africa and southern Africa, the Bible didn't go there until really the 1800s. Not, not I mean, in, in full force. You're talking 200, in the last 200 years, you know, and, and, and so those early missionaries, they would go and they'd reach these villages. They'd go out and preach in the bush like some of our missionaries still do. And the story's been told that those, old, uh, those early African converts would go out into the bush and they would, they would actually form a path through the tall grass. And they would form that path and as they would walk through that grass... That grass, like you do when you go hiking in the mountains and you form a path and you walk over the brush and you sort of lay a path out there. And oftentimes if you go hiking, you can see where others have walked. You say, why? They form the path and those African converts would walk through that tall grass to get to a place where they would get down and they would just spend some fellowship with the Lord. And the story is told that one time a missionary was walking out with a few of them and one of the converts talked to one of his brothers in Christ and says, Dear brother, it appears that your path has been grown up. Have you not been walking in it? You say, why? That was a sign that they had fallen away. You say, why? Well, basically, they had spent time away from Jesus Christ, and as they did that, where the path was became less apparent and became overgrown. You know what God says? He says, find the old paths and don't just look at it. Walk in it. Walk in it. Old paths bring a promise. Jeremiah chapter 6. Look, if you would, at verse number 16. I like this. And you know, usually if you stick around long enough, you'll get to the good news. Amen. Here it is. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 6. You want, you want some rest? For your soul. You know what Jesus says? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. You know what he says? You'll find rest for your souls. The only two places in the Bible where someone has promised rest for their soul, one is in Matthew where Jesus says it. The other one is right here in Jeremiah chapter 6. Look what he says in verse 16. Walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. He said, what is that? Old paths... Bring a promise. You know, as a child of God, even if you're saved, sometimes you just fight with what God wants for you. You fight with what God wants for you. You know what that is? It's pretty tiring. It's pretty tiring. 
If you're lost without Jesus Christ and you're running from God, boy, that's a, tire, that's a tiring and, and seemingly endless endeavor. Try to get your mind away from God, get your mind away from the idea of the afterlife, get your mind away from the Bible, get your mind away. I just, I just want to, I want to get that out. You know, that, that just, it'll leave you without rest. You know what Jesus says? You shall find rest on your souls when you come to me. How do you do that? The old paths. The old paths. Old paths require a choice. Look there at verse number 16 at the end there. They said, we will not walk therein. You know, there's an entire world and even many Christians who don't, they don't want the truth anymore. They want, they want to sort of have their ear tickled and hear something inspiring, which we all want that. Let's be honest. We all want to be inspired. And I can tell you this, you can be inspired when you find truth for, from God. You can be. Because the end can turn out right. He says you can find rest for your souls, but some people are, are willing to exchange inspiration for or truth for inspiration and say, I feel good now. Well, listen, feeling good does not equal truth. Sometimes the truth is this. The other day, can I be honest with you guys? I hope I can be. Uh, the other day, uh, I really didn't want to give someone the gospel. True story. I'm in a rush. I'm trying to get somewhere. And it was just like the Lord saying, don't, don't slip. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. And they asked me a certain question. And I'm thinking, I could answer this normally or I could answer it the gospel way. You know, I, I heard about this preacher. He got uh, someone in his church, one of these mega churches, at the bottom of a $1,000 suit. And he goes to this, it's in Alabama, actually. He goes to this uh, tailor. And this tailor, I think it may have been in Birmingham. I don't know. But he's a man from India, and he has all these gods. And the preacher uh, tells this story as if he's proud of it, which is sad. He gets his, his suit. You know, the guy's working. On, he's there for about an hour. He's doing all the fitting. He's checking all the measurements and, you know, getting everything checked out. And at the end, as he's walking out, the Indian man says, what do you do for a living? He says, oh, I'm, I'm a pastor of a church. You know what that man said? I would never have guessed. He says, every pastor I've ever met always wants to talk to me about his God. You know what that man was touting? That man was touting that, look, I didn't go in there bashing his gods. And, and, and yeah, and you didn't tell him about the truth. Now, that's the leadership today. There's a lot of people I understand that don't want truth. My prayer is that you do. And that you crave it. And that you desire it. And that even when the rest of the world goes in a different direction, you say, you know what? I want to be a disciple for Jesus Christ. I want to follow him as closely as I can. And Lord, I'm not going to be like the nation of Israel was thousands of years ago when you presented them with this opportunity to seek the old paths. And they said, we will not walk therein. That's a choice you make today. You could say, you know what? I'm just going to go on with the rest of the world and be like them and find the new path and blaze my own new trail. Or you could say, you know what, I know what's proven, I know what brings a promise, I know that, it's, that God's behind it, and even if it's not convenient, and even if people make fun of me, and even if it costs me something, I'm going to seek the old paths. Close with this, look at Joshua chapter number 24, Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. Joshua is no longer the, the young buck that he once was, he's... He's an old warrior at this point in his life and ministry, and he's about to head off the scene. So Joshua leaves some final words for the people of Israel. And this is what he has to tell them when they come into the promised land. Joshua 24. And if you're not as familiar with where it is in the Bible, it's the sixth book in the Bible, right after Deuteronomy. Joshua 24, verse 15. And it says this, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day. You know what we need? We need some Christians that just say, you know what? I'm not going to keep writing. I'm not going to keep going along with, I'm halfway here. I'm halfway at church and halfway out there with them. And what they say isn't all that bad. I know it goes against what God says. None of that. Just say, you know what? I love those people. I want to reach them with the gospel. I care about them. And as people go, they might be good people. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to include myself in that anymore. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to stand out. And I'm going to go in the direction of God's path. Choose. Choose. It says this. Choose you this day whom you will serve. 
whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, you said choice is yours, free country, right? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's all stand.